Hi, everyone. I'm Rachel Nelson, director of the UC Santa Cruz Institute of the Arts and Sciences, and I welcome you today for a conversation with artists and filmmakers Noah Toma, Francis Podomo, Aaron Samuel Malenga, and Larry Achampong. This program is part of Surge, our May festival on the theme of transcultural Afrofuturism, spearheaded by ethnomuseologists Carlton Hester, choreographer Gerald Cassell, and Aaron, who of course is also one of our speakers today. With concerts, dance performances, and conversations, the goal of Surge is to gather together creatives working within Afrofuturist traditions. We want to ex um, immerse audiences in current radical experimentations in aesthetics and social justice, bringing diverse communities together through sonic, visual, technological, and embodied forms and creating new modes of being jointly in this world and beyond. We hope you join us this Sunday for a dance and film event with Raisa Simpson and Maura Carr. And for more information about that, we'll put the event listing in the chat. I'll say briefly before I introduce the speakers that when we began thinking about this festival, one of the points that all the collaborators was eager to highlight was that Afrofuturism is a concept that has different resonances based on geography. What it means in the US, what it means on the African continent, what it means in Europe and what it means elsewhere changes balances based on different contexts and histories of struggle for independence and decolonization. We invited our speakers today in order to unpack this a bit for us. And I'm particularly pleased Natoma Francis Badomo, Aaron Samuel Lenga, and Larry Achampong will be speaking to how the concepts of space travel and the figure of the Afronaut relate. We'll begin today with me introducing them in turn to talk to you briefly about their individual practices, then we'll come together for a conversation. If you have questions, please enter them into the Q&A and we'll make sure to add your voices to the discussion. So we're gonna to start today with Natomo Francis Bedomo, who's a nomadic filmmaker of Dagab, Dag, uh, sorry, Dagaba origin, currently based in Ghana in the United States. She earned a BA in film studies at Columbia University and an MFA in film production at NYU's Tisch School of the Arts. Her award-winning short films have played at festivals including Suntance, The Berlin Alley, Terry Died, and others. She served as staff writer and director on the Peabody award-winning first season of Random Acts of Flyness on HBO and co-founded the New Negress Film Society. Thank you so much for being here. Excited to see what you are gonna to talk to us about. Thank you for having me. Um, actually hearing you uh, read that bio kind of solidified exactly why I wanna be speaking today and how I wanna be speaking today about my practice. Um, it's true, I'm a filmmaker, a film director and writer specifically. Um, I'm trained in the sort of like Americanized or let's say international um, film production tradition, film industry production tradition but I didn't come to film with the same sort of background as, as I think a lot of my peers did. Um, I'm born in Ghana. I'm one of these people that moved around a lot. Uh, I grew up in Norway and in Hong Kong as well. Um, moved to the US to go to university. Um, and that's where I started to understand that people looked at films in the way I had learned or had grown up learning to look at literature coming from an academic family. Um, filmmaking for me felt like and in like an innate language that felt really useful given my background in terms of, I'd grown up seeing so many cultures mishmashed together. And so it was very hard to maybe articulate in one spoken word language or in one textual language and speak to all the people um, that I knew and I had grown up with and were near and dear to my heart. And so filmmaking immediately became this language that just had all these tools to say a lot in layered ways at the same time. And that to me, I feel like is the basis both for my, filmmaking well why I came to filmmaking but also why travel um especially like intense travel erratic travel space travel is really central to my to my practice so um, I'm going to share my screen um, okay so true to the idea of travel I thought one way for me to really share about where I'm at, because over the past few years, I have um, really shifted my practice away from maybe what I'm known for. Um, and so I wanted to go to my Instagram and start from the bottom and kind of scroll up as a way of taking this journey through what the film journey has been. Um, so it's a bit experimental, so bear with me, but I think I think there'll be some gems. Um, 
so this is the my Instagram I joined 10 years ago. Um, I was still a, a student of film school. Um, my short film Afronauts, no, my first short film Bone Shaker was about to premiere at Sundance in 2013. That's where we're seeing this. Um, so I went through a very black and white era in the, in the early days. I only broke it really to, um, the first time I broke it was for this image. This is an image from the initial scout for when we were shooting Afronaut. So this is March, 2013, about three weeks before we shot the film. Um, I had found a video of uh, Zambian astronauts on Tumblr via YouTube um, and been so engrossed by the idea that there was this history and that, um, you know, this, this was something that had happened but hadn't been able to find a lot online. And so being in film school and having this opportunity to make a film, I just sort of went into this sort of like uh, fever dream production, let's say, of just wanting to explore those images and the images that were coming up from reading a lot about the Afronaut story and the Edward Mukuka and Coloso story. So I was just sort of uh, bringing together um, a lot of the images that came up in the very initial research. Um, I bring up this picture because I was in film school. I was in New York City um, and we ended up shooting Afronauts in the US because of that. So most of, most of the short film happens on a soundstage. And then we were looking for landscapes that could, um, you know, pass for something otherworldly. Of course, um, Zambia is a very lush, verdant, is a country with a very, like, generally very lush and verdant landscape, tropical landscape. I don't know if that's the technical word, so I won't say that. Um, but we were focusing on finding a landscape that looked like we were already on the moon. So in the black and white era, which what we're scrolling through is me going to festival after festival with, um, Bone Shaker, which would then become festival after festival with Afronauts. With Afronauts, I was try I was from Jump, always saying I want to make a feature film of this film. This short film is just a mood piece that is enabling me to get into these rooms. I'm trying to make a feature film. I want to actually go to Zambia and make this on the ground. Um, and that took me on many journeys. It took me uh, on many. I'm just like scrolling as I'm speaking. Um, on many journeys to labs, markets, you know, like I was in the film industry aspect of what we call filmmaking. And so, and I was in film school being trained to do that. And so the first opportunities that were coming to me were really based on film festivals, film labs, film markets, all of which started to really amount to nothing. This is an image from the premiere of Afronauts, the short film at Sundance many years ago. Um, I went to uh, writer's residencies, writing the script, um, quite a few. Uh, it also took me to, I just wanna scroll up so I don't get stuck here, let's see. I went, I uh, did a Berlin Alley script station with this script. Um, and it was eventually able to do an initial research like research trip to southern africa so there because the story in the in the film has this sort of like moon landscape aspect we were able to visit namibia and visit the moon landscape um this is the namibian landscape um this is an image from the first day ever getting into zambia this is um uh, let's see <laughs> I know that I know that Arid is, is Zambia, so I don't want to screw up the pronunciation, but uh, Shungu Namutitima, a waterfall, which means the smoke that thunders. thunders. Um, it's the first time being in Zambia. While we were in Zambia, we started to do initial research, uh, which was around going to the National, National Archives um, in the capital. Um, but this research, we didn't get enough money. So it was a very short trip. I was back in America looking for the money to try and make this film. I went to sort of the Sundance labs twice, like all of which is to say, because I think this is not the biggest part of this. You know, I was this, you know, Ghanaian girl in transit, traveling around looking for a home that would enable me to make Afronauts as a feature film at the level that it needed to be made. I thought, you know, um, like a, as, as a movie with a budget because it has all these set pieces, rockets going off and, you know, this sort of like moon journey aspect, but then also um, wanted to be able to make it on the ground 
with Zambians in local language of Bemba and Nyanja. So this was always sort of like, this journey took me to many places, um, but, but you know, I wasn't really, my practice ended up being just begging at many doorsteps for money to make a film that people in the world I was in couldn't quite see. So um, in 2018, I ended up through the, the film body Cinereach getting a grant um, to go to Zambia for six months to do a research trip, a proper research trip. What it looked like on Instagram was that I posted this image from Safi Fai's Kadube Cut, her first film, a film that I've never been able to see, but I've really wanted to see. Um, and I went offline. And I think I'm, I'm mentioning that because I feel like the my, my practice and like my journey shifted a lot from trying to make this film, trying to prove to sort of American funding bodies that this film mattered to kind of realizing that something else was happening and that the journey was more around maybe being quiet and maybe the journey around sort of African media and African things, the things that are seen when it came to Africa and African sort of uh, indigenous knowledge systems and things like that were not about what was gonna be shown, but I wanted to like move away from the journey of pitching the story to an Americanized space to maybe trying to be in a place where I'm finding the story in, in, in its reality. And so that took going offline. And I used Kadu Bay Cut because it's a film that Safi Fai, the first woman, the first Afri woman of African descent, African woman of African descent to make a feature film. This is her first feature and it's largely unavailable, but it exists. Um, so that research trip, I went with two producers. This is Vincho and Chogi and Tobias Tembo. Um, we ended up meeting with Edward Mukukankoloso's son, and he sent us across the country. Zambia has 10 provinces. We went to nine of them, just finding anyone we could find connected to the story and, and interviewing and interviewing and interviewing and rediscovering what the story was. So when I got to Zambia, I really thought, oh, this is a film about a guy who started a space, a space program. But from being on the ground, speaking to people of many different, you know, people who were part of the space program as they named it, but then also part of a freedom movement, part of, you know, life in Zambia in the 60s, by speaking to a large swath of people, we started to realize that actually, this was a story about a freedom movement, you know, an independence movement. We're talking to freedom fighters, people who, were enacting the impossible every day in their fight for freedom. And, and the, you know, the space program was just another thing that came out of that. That's how I read it coming out of all the um, oral histories that we gathered. Um, and what I mean by that is that in Coloso was, it seems to be a man who had lived so many lives. He had been a soldier, um, a union organizer, a freedom fighter, a teacher, um, and had gathered so much respect for what he did. He was so important that he used to stand next to Kenneth Kaunda, the first president of Zambia um, during rallies. Um, so he had become so important that he, you know, enacting all these impossible things that at some point he then said he wanted to go to the moon and he had the backing and the people behind him to say, yes, we want to do that with you. And so tracking that journey, not that it's just, oh, it's, you know, I think in the spaces that I was in, Afronauts came off as like, ha ha, the African space program, ha ha ha, we're going to laugh. And I think there's a lot of hilarity in this story. I love that about it. But I was more kind of situating it in something much bigger, which was um, about enacting the impossible and, and winning during a freedom movement. So that was a lot that came out of being able to go to Zambia and be on the ground and just, you know, actually be responding to reality and trying to craft this story. Um, but since then, I came back um, to, we spent a long time in Zambia. This is um, from a mall in a, a clip from a, like a picture taken from a mall in Zambia that has like a huge cinema in Lusaka in the capital. Um, but still that, that research and that new basis for the film didn't quite, you know, speak to um, the people I was asking for money from to make this film. So I wanted to put take on this post. This is, I started to look for something different, I think. This is about, what when was this from? It's like 2019. Um, and I just wanna read from this post that I made in 2019. 
I said, I am interested in the difference between taking and reclaiming. I resent where religious self-abnegation is conflated with radical self-undoing. I have an aversion to the idea that time is spent. I know the things we are rethinking have actually come before us. I am reminded that my people, the Dagaba, are some of the last to trade with carry shells. And it is a spiritual economy that I understand via the fact that my groundless beginnings gave me language in place of land. And I named that uh, musing in search of a new economy. I think my journey was just getting to a place where I was done <laughs> with the systems. I think, you know, sometimes as an artist, you're told if you play here and you do this and you do that and you do this, you're going to get this little carrot we've been dangling. And I was really not having that experience after years of being, of, you know, winning a lot of grants and being really named and really name and lights. It wasn't amounting to the actual resources to make a film at the level that I knew I was capable of, but also that the story necessitated. Um, and so I ended up moving. This is a picture from our research trip. And this is um, when we were scouting land uh, uh, waterfalls in Zambia. It's another image I put up before I went offline for a while. In that going offline, I ended up moving back to Ghana in December 2019, not expecting to stay. This is, this is from my home in Ghana, in Accra, my family home. Um, not expecting to stay, but because of the pandemic, I ended up being in Ghana for two plus years. Um, and while I'm in Ghana and remember off the backs of I've been doing this, this film for so long and it's not happening and I, what else can I do? Where's the money for this film? That I think it's so important, but you know, nothing is really coming to me. Um, I'm in Ghana and my practice sort of starts to shift, maybe because we're all resting during the pandemic more, but um, my I will say that for a moment, I decided, what if I'm not a filmmaker anymore? Let me just be out here. Um, and then moving away from sort of an idea of myself as a filmmaker, I just started to pick up my camera phone, right? Like the phone on my camera just became my tool. So I was taking a lot of walks. This is my neighborhood in Accra, Hacho. I was taking a lot of walks and just using my camera. And then really my, 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 gaze and my practice and the way I make movies became just a lot around pointing the camera for extended periods of time and creating loops because one one aspect of my own sort of like filmmaking history is, is Vine. So at first I was actually just trying to create Vine loops um, online, um, but eventually it just became... <laughs> And as you can see, there was it's always with amusing. Always with amusing. But I, you know, what I loved is that by being in Ghana, um, the practice just became more about documentary realism. That clip is from Tamale. Um, I, I moved back to Accra, the capital city where my family home is, but I'm actually from Northern Ghana and actually connect a lot more to my sort of like uh, specific indigenous background. So I ended up moving to Northern Ghana and this is the city of Tamale where I'm also currently based when I'm not in the US. Um, I wanted to, I traveled a lot around Ghana and I wanted to show this clip too. <laughs> of time I'll just let that play and scroll through more while I speak but why I'm showing this is 
you know, um, while I was in Ghana, my own practice became more lo-fi um, and also about the camera phone um, and something more documentary. But I also started to engage more with local African cinema um, and both in terms of like the aesthetic and the production value, but also in terms of where it gets seen. So this is me on a bus from Kumasi to Tamale. And these are the as a movie showing on the bus. So, you know, also, you know, when I'm thinking, when I'm talking about shifting to sort of African modes of viewership and African film, it's not just the works, uh, the aesthetics, but just also different places of showing a film and different, um, you know, different uh, relationships to what a film is and its place in a room when it's playing. Um, so yeah, I think while in Ghana, I really spent time setting up my own sort of, I don't say company, film entity, it's called Mother Tongue. Uh, Mother Tongue is kind of an entity through which I do a lot of my practice. It's this sort of video work. <laughs> sort of like docu video work, more in the interest of making African movies. And from the clip I previously showed, you can see like also the pathos I'm talking about and the sort of like emotion, emotionality and melodrama I'm talking about that I'm really also trying to engage, but also just everyday realism, which it's such a joy, you know, I, when I earlier on, I was showing that I was in the US uh, trying to find a, a landscape to maybe be Zambia, you know, like these kind of like negotiations of being, um, elsewhere trying to film something that is supposed to be in another place versus just being in the place where you're wanting to tell a story and just pointing the camera and this is everyday life happening in front of you. That's been the largest shift, just wanting to make movies um, lo-fi um, within an African movie aesthetic, but also in terms of modes of viewership, that's like very exciting to me. Um, and I also wanted to share that that practice, though, has also done been a lot of like giving lectures and doing a lot of talks. Uh, two major things that I, I did um, was uh, unbraiding three yeah, X structure. Unbraiding three X structure. So this is a, a very <laughs> once you see webcam video lecture that I gave where I was um, thinking through three X structure and the mode, the ways I'd been forced to learn how to write films and that it was so based in Greek traditions and Greek the tradition of the Greek tragedy. And so wanting to undo three act structure and come up with a new way to structure film writing. And through, I give it as a lecture and then I end up exploring the idea that maybe Kente cloth could be um, a narrative structure if you looked at it in a certain way, right? So let me. For me, what I'm seeing here is definitely. And I think that those moments are like incredibly suspenseful. You know, like I'm really seeing like, I hesitate to say this, but like suspenseful at the level of like a heist. There's something big happening, you know, that level of suspense. And to me, we're following similar or the same characters throughout. And these characters are going through moments of- So in the interest of time, um, what, what's happening here is I'm sort of just looking at clots and trying to see, okay, here's a, a film structure that I see from this Kente clot. You know, I know that Kente has meaning and that every color means something and can tell you a lot about who it was made for, but I was trying to look at it less in, in that type of meaning and more in its structural relational sort of pattern-based meaning. And that's what I was using to create um, film plots. Um, and that to me was coming from this meditation I'd had in 20, uh, many years ago, or like in 2019, in this practice of trying to write these long captions with media, um, which was just about the fact that it's not enough to say fucking narrative, no, like box braids, like the box braids you had in for over four months, the ones that are now in the struggle part, the ones that necessitate more maintenance and scalp scratching than you'd like to admit, they will simply just proceed to become a part of you. And it's not enough to say fuck a narrative, a narrative is something you must sit and undo. And that's what led me to unbraiding three act structure. It's not enough for me to say, screw it, three act structure doesn't matter. There's like, it's, there's like a, a, an imperative to make a pedagogical affront because every day students are going into classrooms wanting to learn how to weave what they've seen into filmic 
narrative structure and being forced into structures that aren't serving the stories they're telling. So for me, it was very important to do the unbraiding and do that. Another um, uh, sort of more written piece that I did, I gave a keynote called Beyond the Colonial Camera, Three Departures that uh, ended up being published in Scene Journal. I, I mentioned that one because it was a lot around looking through the idea that, uh, looking at the idea that the we understand the, colon the camera to be a colonial tool and a tool that was used to colonize us, in, especially administratively, let's say. Um, but me being somebody who has been a filmmaker since I was a teenager, I also see this, I also use this tool and I can't give it away to the colonizer. I can't just say it's colonial and therefore I give it to the colonizer. And so I was thinking through ways to unpack and undo that relationship between that colonial relationship with the camera. Um, and there's uh, three things I'll point to before I'm done. One is that because I live in Tamale, it's a six hour ride from Ouagadougou. Last year, I got to attend the FESPACO Film Festival, which had been such a goal and a dream uh, since I did my thesis in African film for my undergrad studies um, to get to attend that festival. And so that's one, one huge thing that sort of has been part of the shift that is happening for me in my practice. Um, and then um, I will also say that I have not given up on telling the Afronaut story. I, I just am using other methods. So um, last year we were also able, I was also able to revisit, let me, let me just pause on that. I was also able to revisit um, some of the oral histories we had collected specifically from Honorable Sekota Wina, who, which was the most high profile, um, interview that we got. He was a member of the first cabinet of Zambia. So um, he was there in, in the Afronauts expansion. I make it take, it takes place on the first independence day, the day that the Union Jack is falling and the, the Zambian flag is rising. So there's that moment in the film, it's a huge moment. And we asked him about what it felt like to be there after a whole freedom struggle, after an independence movement, and you're sitting there and one flag is falling and the other flag is rising. And uh, this was his answer. Messages from the Queen to a red flag, a representative who was sent to represent the Queen, and also received the Union Jail, because after it was lowered, but all the people in the Great Chapel and the government told you they were the So one thing I love about just getting to hear it um, from an elder, here in Afri African histories from elders, let's say, is, you know, here he's talking about the way in which the flag was folded as it, as it was put away. And I think that's something that, those, it's those details and those intimacies that I really want to gather and bring to the screen as I'm trying to, you know, expand this Afronaut story. I think, you know, um, part of why it's taking so long is, is really wanting it to be a film from the ground up that, that feels like it was told from a Zambian perspective. And I know I'm not even Zambian, you know, like this is me as an international person thinking through like international filmic models, but like really wanting to stay true to that the basis of the film that we make is these oral histories that we gathered, is the perspectives that we, that we heard because you know, in that sense, the film became a sort of collective memory as opposed to just a biopic about Edward Mukukankoloso, which I'm less interested in making. Um, so I'll end with um, this image and an image I want to pull up outside of Instagram if it works is, so part of building mother tongue, I've said that I've been doing speaking engagements, I've been doing written works, I've been trying to undo sort of like the way we're taught to make films. Um, I've been still working on Afronauts and pushing that forward. From the oral histories angle, I got to go to Fesbaco. 
for me, it all the, the work I did in Ghana before I came back to the US culminated in getting to shoot this short film in search of Yeninga. And one big project that's been near and dear to my heart for a long time is to tell the story of the legendary warrior pr princess Yeninga, um, who is from Northern Ghana and whose son ended up founding the Moshi Empire. And so she is a queen mother in Burkina Faso. She's sort of this figure that connects across colonial borders. Um, and so one way to access that story was just to tell the story, which it is about Amabia. Mabia is the language groups that join Northern Ghana to Burkina Faso, no, so across the colonial border. Um, it's a Mabia warrior from the year 3000, tra time travels to 2020's Tamale in search of the girl that would become the founding mother of her nation. So one, the access point into the Yeninga story is to have this warrior who knows about Yeninga, who knows her and knows her power come back to Tamale today, where when you look at the situation of like a lot of younger girls, they're not being treated. They don't know that, you know, the histories, the, the women of our history are so powerful. It's so amazing. And like, we're not, you know, trained into subservience, into the subservience that is expected of a lot of girls today. So really wanting to use time bending and time travel to really tell that story. So, and, and to really confront that sort of like, what this warrior queen who should be lauded isn't lauded in this era like what is happening here um so that's that's one project that i'm working on now um and the way it worked is we this is weala weala is one of ghana's biggest musicians we dressed her up in this costume sort of like um retro futuristic is what we're calling it and we walked around tamale just asking random people we went into markets transport yards schools we were asking people have you seen yaninga she just walked around and engaged people and started asking like have you seen her have you seen her and sadly but truthfully nobody knew who she was and just getting to use this sort of like time travel moving around town docu hybrid method to sort of try and tell that story and this is, I have a, my share screen capabilities may betray me at this point, but I wanted to show this. Is this, are we seeing a, an, a, an image right now, a, a, a still image right now? No, we're still seeing the Instagram. Okay, page. okay. Then let me stop sharing and, and share again. I think. Okay, there we go. Okay, so now it's just an image, right? Yes. Okay, great. So I wanted to end with this because um, I have talked through my journey as a filmmaker coming from Ghana originally, but somebody who has traveled a lot growing up, one of these third culture kids and coming to filmmaking, wanting to, to, you know, bring together so many aspects of my upbringing and background and tell it using all the layered tools we have as a filmmaker. And that journey to being a filmmaker, taking me into the Americanized film industry um, and really being in that space, thing of trying to make it work and then making this journey to shift. All this while I was carrying in my heart this dream of making a movie in, in Africa, on the ground in Africa. And that seemed to be a sort of like disconnect for with the money I was sourcing. But, you know, in March, two months ago, I was, I looked up and I was in Ghana in production on a lo-fi African movie um, that brought, you know, that was also... Afrofuturist, docu-hybrid. It was just like truly from the ground up and truly from the world around me. Um, and so to be able to look up and experience that, I just wanted to share this crew photo um, as sort of like the current culmination of where the journey has taken me. And just the fact that I just looked up and suddenly I was where I'm trying to be. So that's it for me. Let me stop share. That was amazing. And thank you so much. I'm really looking forward to the discussion. I think you've given us so much to talk about and so much to think about, but I'll have you turn off now and I'll introduce Aaron Samuel Malenga to thank join you. our voices in the conversation. Thanks so much for that. It was fascinating. So Aaron is a multimedia artist from Zambia whose visual practice is inspired by concepts of ancestry and legacy. His practice includes sculptural forms, installation, performance, and, consult and collage. Malenga is currently a PhD student at a oh, candidate in visual studies at UC Santa Cruz and a research fellow with us at the Institute of the Arts and Sciences. And we're very lucky to have him. 
Malenga has exhibited at the Zico Museum in Cape Town, the Zambian National Art Gallery, and in 2021, FNB Art Fair in Johannesburg. He's also participating in this year's Congo Biennale in Kinshasa. So Aaron, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, wow, thank you so much, Noatama, for that offering that you just gave us. It's amazing uh, listening to what you just had to share. Um, I'll go ahead and share my, my screen. <clears throat> So for me, the story of the Afronaut started um, with images such as, such as this one. This, uh, many people are familiar with depictions such as this showing uh, Christ as uh, a, a, white, a white man. And this picture was taken in, in, in Kitwe, a town in Zambia. Um, so I grew up with so many of these images in a, like a family Bible where Christ was depicted ascending to heaven in this sort of form. And I began to ask questions around, um, what would happen if this depiction changed? What would happen if Christ began to look more, um, like, like the local people, you know, like the Zambians, Black, uh, and, and that work led me to this church called um, the Marianne Shrine in, in Lusaka. So in this, uh, for, those, for those people who are not very familiar with the map, uh, Zambia is located to the southern region uh, of the continent. So in, in that church, um, I came across paintings by a very prolific uh, artist, Lawrence Yombwe, and he's someone who's inspired my, my work a lot. Uh, this particular piece is called prayer of, um, of, of people in Africa before Christianity. And it depicts um, individuals praying at a shrine, uh, giving their offerings to their ancestors or their gods. And what, what stood out to me was the fact that this work was presented inside of um, a Christian church. And so it reminded me of um, works that the church were doing such as um, enculturation, in order to preach the gospel to people uh, through a, a visual language or narrative that they could understand. But it was more interesting what, what Yombo was doing, which was flipping the Christian iconographic imagery or language on its head and beginning to engage with the questions that I was interested in, for instance, asking how would it be if Christ uh, became this sort of black figure. And, in this image called African Saints in Heaven, he portrays Christ as half black, half white, sort of starting to begin that conversation about shifting power, shifting narratives. He pictures um, Mary as a, as a black, black woman, and he also includes uh, saints that are, are indigenous or local, uh, such as the one with the drum in the background called Siluanga. This so here's a, a closer image of, of this. This in, in turn led me to um, start to explore objects found in the museum. So this was in the Livingston Museum. And I began to engage with objects that looked at uh, flight, spiritual flight. So in the previous images, you see Christ ascending to heaven with some spiritual power. But here, these objects um, were, <clears throat> were used by people for flight and, and it happened uh, it happened in at night it happened in a in a sort of um, as a closed group you had to be initiated into some of these groups but what was interesting to me is is the language that the museum used to describe these objects they categorize them as witchcraft objects and they put them in in a section in the museum where it's it makes one uh, fearful or afraid to sort of engage with these stories because it's they, they carry this sort of negative language and connotation. And so with, with my work, I started to ask how can that narrative be shifted? Because the people who use these objects wouldn't term them as witchcraft objects. How does one uh, begin to engage with a sort of local spirituality and local technology in a way that opens up possibilities to imagine a, a sort of different future with engaging with ideas of culture, engaging with ideas of the future, 
and also what um, technology could look like. So this object here is a tortoise shell um, with wax and human hair on it. It's got around it a cloth, which would be considered traditional fabric or Dutch wax print. And it's got beads where the head of the, the object would be. Now, it has been difficult to find practitioners who are willing to open up about how they use these objects because um, witchcraft is uh, outlawed in Zambia. And so people aren't forthcoming to, to talk about these things because they feel you know, they would be in jeopardy or in danger. And so I, I choose to, to, to display this image only because you know, it, it exists in a public forum in, in the museum, but it's the language that uh, is of interest to me. How does that shift? How does that change? Um, how does it become more inclusive from a, a local setting and not in a way that is prohibitive or making us think in a way that allows us to be afraid of these objects? That led me to uh, Mukukan Koloso's story and the Afronauts. The Afronauts for me play a bridge um, to be able to cross that boundary of engaging with ideas of spirituality in a way that um, doesn't allow us to come from a place of fear, but rather from a place of knowledge and understanding. So I started to have these figures of these Afronaut characters. This was the first one that I did. It's a collage piece using the Chitenge material and each of the helmets is, is golden to make reference back to the, the, the Christian iconography that has a halo and um, ideas of, of representation start to, start to take place. Um, so I also use images from um, some of the masks that are present. So you can see on, on this particular one's forehead, the Chingelengele exists, it's present there. And this is meant to be a reference to a cosmogram that talks about the cycle of life. Um, I won't go into the detail of, of each of the images and sort of the symbolism, but that's, that plays a very important role in the work that I'm doing because I guess I'm trying to go back to cultural heritage, go back to ancestry and ask, how do we draw from the past? How do we draw from the present to think about the future in a way that allows us to think of spirituality in a way that is not prohibitive? So this is going to be my last image. Um, and I'm just going to read a small excerpt that I wrote about the, the Afronaut pieces. So the work of the Afronauts is to call on history, to remember the stories of the past, such as those of Nkoloso and our ancestors, and to ask questions about the future and what role technology, even spiritual technology plays in shaping our future existence. The Afronauts draw from Christian iconography and Zambian culture to trouble a simple interpretation of these stories through their use of amalgamation. Through the Afronauts, I'm able to ask questions about what role Zambian culture and concepts of spirituality play in shaping a brighter future for the people of Zambia and the African continent at large. Um, so I will end uh, there because, uh, yeah, Rachel, you, you, you can take over. Thanks, Aaron. Thank you so much for that. So, and last but certainly not least, we have Larry Chompong, a British Ghanaian artist, a Ghanaian artist, whose work includes moving image, sculptural installation, photographic and painted collage, audio and visual archives, live performance, spoken word, recorded sound bites, and composed scores. Chompong has exhibited, performed, and presented projects within the UK and abroad, including Tate Britain. Tate Modern, the Institute for Creative Arts, Cape Town, the British Film Institute, Bacor African Popular Music Archives Foundation in Accra, the Logan Center for Exhibitions in Chicago, Prospect New Orleans, the Diaspora Pavilion at the 57th Venice Biennale, Somerset House London, among others. So thank you so much for joining us, Larry. We've been very much looking forward to this. My pleasure. And um... First, thank you both uh, Notama and, and Aaron for your incredible uh, presentations. Um, I think to start off, one of the things that's really excited me about uh, today is how, how this story of us kind of all talking together today is somewhat serendipitous of sorts. Um, 
I never actually got to see uh, Neil Timer's uh, Afronauts work until very recently, actually. Uh, I, I'm very much kind of like a geek when it comes to looking up things online. And when I started developing the Other Relic Traveler project in 2016, um, my producer and close friend of mine, Nefertiti Boshi Shandor, fellow Ghanaian, um, mentioned uh, Nortama's uh, work. And I'd, ne I'd never heard of it, never heard of it at all. Um, and then I tried to look it up. And I don't know if it's because, you know, being kind of like separated through, you know, thousands of miles, different regions and stuff, I just wasn't able to, to access the film. So when I came across um, uh, Nortama's uh, mother tongue uh, pseudonym, I was so excited to be able to sit down, to uh, absorb and to actually think about the other kinds of the, the connections across our practices. Um, it was great to have that that introduction because um, I I'm spoken about as a filmmaker, a, a multimedia artist. I work across mediums. I work with film, sound. I make music. I produce all of the um, the, the the soundtracks for all of my films to date. Um, installation, you know. I, I was trained in, in, in art school. I went to University of Westminster, finished in 2005, then to the other Slade School of Fine Art, finished 2008, did an MA there. Um, but my kind of like approach to filmmaking has always been um, very much, I'd say, in, 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 in the kind of like breath and approach that uh, Nortama is talking about in terms of, um, I guess, like I never really kind of like had the language for it at the time, but it's certainly a decolonial uh, method um, in that my mum was probably my teacher um, she taught me how to how to make films um, she loved cinema she grew up watching kung fu movies uh, Bollywood films um, all kinds of stuff um, and, and growing up in the 80s and the 90s in in, uh, in East London um, she would uh, she would play all kinds of films, whether it's the likes of Enter the Dragon or Predator with Arnold Schwarzenegger or uh, Sita Gita, really cool Bollywood film. Um, and we would play these films <clears throat> back to back, like remembering kind of like lines and things like that. But I guess I, I never really, even at that point in time, thought about, you know, making films. But that coupled with, you know, reading um, X-Men comics and watching the X-Men animated series, uh, playing all kinds of video games from, you know, Shinobi through to Super Mario, through to Sonic the Hedgehog, and, 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 and being, I guess, part of that generation that saw 3D worlds kind of like growing from, you know, the 2D space. Um, it, it certainly was a, an area to, to allow me to kind of dream, essentially. Um, so it's very important for me to point that out, to point you know, point out that, you know, even in terms of my approach to filmmaking, I very much try to work in a resourceful way. I work a lot with my family. I work very much with people that I know. Um, and, uh, and, and, and I try as much as possible to work with, um, with, with as many black women as, as, as possible, knowing that even within the art scene, uh, um, you know, uh, black women are, are pushed to the other, the, the periphery, let alone black men as well. Um, so, weaving that all in with with even the intent to tell stories from a a perspective that i feel uh is 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 not represented so well or uh, uh, at best tends to be um done in a way that is uh patronizing where it comes to you know whiteness um that's been very very important to my practice so you know relic traveler um really at the heart of it um was a was a space um that, that I conjured that allowed me to dream, you know, kind of like a context of, of, of growing up within a, a lack of visible heroes, black heroes, superheroes, you know, my interest again in comics and games and films essentially are what brought me to that space. And I also, I, I wanted to tell a story. I wanted to tell stories to my, my kids. I'm a parent, I have two kids, a 13 year old and eight year old going on 36 and, um, I wanted to be able to tell stories to my my kids in a way that I felt I, I'd never been told before and and I knew wouldn't be kind of like readily available to them. Um, in a way, little did I kind of, I wasn't even thinking as much about it in the time, but 
I guess again, um, you know, it's the interesting thing with 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 time and thought, with with space and and, and hindsight, you're able to kind of like build on on your your, your thought process and 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 progress. And um, you know, before long, I was very much thinking about my son and my daughter being these characters, these relic travelers. Um, of course, you will have seen from some of the um, the um, text that that I've placed within this presentation that you know relic travelers are um, people who um, from within the African Union are sent outside of the African Union using um, space travel potential technology to pick up vocal testimonies and other clues from people who've been oppressed through uh, various um, forms of exploitation uh, including capitalism globalization and and, and so on um, Unfortunately, I wasn't able to work with my daughter at the time. She was too young. At the time, she was around three years old. But my son um, was the age of my daughter now, actually, was, was around eight years old. And I think one of the, one of the really interesting um, catalysts that kind of got the project really going for me was a, a, a visit to um, Cape Town, in South Africa, in 2017. I was invited by... Um, by a friend of mine to do a, a, a talk and performance at the, uh, the University of, of Cape Town. And I hadn't returned uh, to the African continent in around two, nearly, two decades, nearly three decades. And I remember um, it was such an important moment for me personally to be able to be, to be returning. Um, I, I, the, the, the time that I'd previously uh, had my feet set on the African continent was the uh, the late nineties, and I remember taking a, a cab ride from the, um, the the airport, and the the, the driver was a, a Senegalese, and you know he was he was asking me, oh you know where are you from, brother? Where are you travelling from? And I was explaining that I was I'd come in from the UK and that it had been very you know a long time since I, I'd returned to to uh, the African continent. And he said, uh, well, well, Africa welcomes you, brother. Please don't, don't leave it so long next time. And that really sat with me. It sat with me at a point in time where I was going to be, you know, presenting a, an audiovisual performance that explored um, time travel, explored experiences of uh, blackness from a multitude of, of perspectives. But little did I know that I would begin uh, to kind of like kickstart the, uh, the, the the Relic Traveler series. And Relic Traveler, obviously, as you will see through these images that I'm presenting to you, and I'm not trying to be linear in time because it's just, there's way too much for us to, to, to go through. And I'm really interested in getting to, to having a conversation uh, is a project that is not simply just represented through film. It's represented through prose. It's represented through uh, performance installation. Um, but more and more so within my practice, and I've certainly been um, driven by, is to have a conversation. And similar to uh, what uh, Nortama said earlier, is to have a conversation that goes beyond the gallery space. And I'm going to get straight to the point in that, you know, I grew up in a, a, the political underclass. I grew up in poverty, um, East London, where I grew up, and then later Dagenham in Essex. Um, they are not places that most people who occupy the art scene will have spent time in. Um, and it's important for me in exploring and telling and talking about some of these stories, because I am, I'm aware of my own position and, and the fact that I'm kind of lucky in, 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 in the sense that um, I could very much be in, in a place where I'm not talking to yourselves right now. But in acknowledging that, and then thinking about the fact that I'm making this work, what's important to me actually is how the work can be accessed. So over the years, of course, I've thought and, and expressed through my practice multitudes of ways that the work that I produce can exist, not simply just within a gallery itself, even free galleries. You know, we have in the UK, we have a lot of you know, public um, uh, organizations the model I'm sure I, I'm aware of is, is quite different in the United States for example but um, but even then you know um, 
local communities, communities from working class backgrounds and lower working class backgrounds and so on, they tend to be ostracized or at best, they tend to be patronized, gaslit, um, which for me is, 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 is a big problem. And so through the examples that I'm showing you for it, you know, here, the, the, the project of Relic Traveler has, it has kind of like mushroomed into various spaces where they're utilizing the form of a flag, which again, and initially within the, the when I was developing the other film, the, the flag actually wasn't something that was going to exist. It was supposed to simply exist as a, a, a patch logo that uh, identified different um, segments of the Relic Travelers Alliance. Um, and when I was initially approached by Somerset House to create a flag, if I'm honest with you, the trauma of, of, of flags, of Western flags for me popped up. I thought very much about the St. George's flag. I thought very much about uh, my time growing up and walking through streets in East London or, or Essex uh, and, and seeing whether it was the St. George's flag or even the Union Jack and feeling like this, this I, I don't feel like I, I belong here. I was born and I'm, and I'm being raised here, but I do not feel, I do not feel welcome. And, and, and of course, I'd be reminded by that if I was on the train, uh, you know, traveling on uh, the, the, the London Underground, the district line, uh, you have West Ham supporters on a weekend. And if they've lost a match and you're black, you don't want to be there. So to think about the, 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 these, these multitudes of moments of experience and then the, the, the approach to even creating work for me, it's, it's not enough simply creating the work. It's about how the work exists, where the work goes, who gets to access that as a result of that. And that's something that I've continued to try to push forward with my practice um, up through and uh, until this moment, even where I've um, I recently shot and directed my uh, first feature film. And again, kind of crossover with uh, Notama um, in that, I, I shot a film on a really small budget. I'm not going to say the number, a, a, a budget that, you know, compared even to my uh, peers within the art scene, even with the short films that certain artists may, may produce, um, was certainly way smaller. Um, but what was important in, in, in this film that, that we shot titled Wayfinder, which in some ways kind of shares parallels with, with uh, Relic Traveler, but is very much its own self-contained story. It's located within uh, the, the British Isles and uh, follows the other travels of a young black girl from as north possible in, in England, staring out toward um, Scotland from uh, Bowness and Solway by Hadrian's Wall, which is um, a kind of like, was a Roman settlement and pushes all the way down south to a certain point or, or edge of, uh, of England looking out um, from, from Margate. Um, really the intent to try to push the fidelity or the capability of, 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 of storytelling, of, of, of bringing forth elation, but with, with these lo-fi means. And, 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 and um, again, I think that's why I'm really excited about uh, partially talking about today. Uh, I feel like as, as a practitioner, I've kind of been talking about this kind of approach almost on my own within the uh, the, the space of the uh, the art scene so to be connected here today to be to be able to have that that opportunity to explore um and and share and to learn i'm i'm very very much excited about um i want to now play uh, a few minutes of uh relic free um which is the uh, the full film within the Relic Traveller series, there are five uh, short films. Um, I'm not really gonna give a synopsis. You've, you've, you've got stuff you can access online. And um, yeah, I'm just gonna show the, showcase that now and uh, looking forward to talking further.
Kwame Mensa many jobs. We call him this because he do so many jobs. He traveled this land same time as Esu. But he somehow find work, lots just like that. He say he want for take all the money Queen and Empire take from us and return it home. I don't think he make it back home home. I worry about him. His body won't go on forever doing this work. Back to back, and he no rest. He not eat real food, only this oily fish and cheap business. He say if he spend money to make home food, then he de take home less money. He's stuck in deep, like Duffy. Every day is a working day. The factory took so many in. Those of us that migrated here. They know we need the money. And that no one else will do the type of work they are asking to be done. It is dangerous. You read in the papers that this country goes crazy over health and safety. But I heard that the last wave of migrant workers were fired after one of them died in the plastic parking machine. You wouldn't have heard about it in the paper because an immigrant's life has no value. Placeable, desperate to work, expandable, untraceable, no papers, a ghost. Rojo said the poor fool probably couldn't read English and trap himself in there. Rojo has no heart for the dead, nor does he have a brain at the best of times. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Larry. And Natoma and Aaron, do you want to join us now? We can have a conversation. And I'll say to everybody here, if you have questions too, feel free to put them in the chat and I'll incorporate them into our conversation. So this was amazing. I have to say there's so many things going through my mind. And I, but I did think that maybe we could just start with the kind of the, um, the structure through which we've gathered us together, right? So there's kind of two things is that we were approached uh, last year to think about having an Afrofuturism festival. And, you know, I've been working with Aaron and one of the things that we really were grappling with was that where is the, the, where is the term Afrofuturism relevant and valid? And where, who feels attached to that term? Because it has a history in the United States that's very specific, you know, that comes, um, that emerges, or I mean, emerges in lots of different ways, but you could track it, you know, through Sun Ra, you could track it through a history of music, but that does not necessarily move beyond it. I and mean, we had this great conversation last week with 
to people in which we were talking about um, the Pan-African Festival, Festac in Nigeria in 1977, when Sun Ra played, 5,000 people got up and left, right? So I was just wondering about this, you know, and what we try to do in the invitation to you is not to impose the term Afrofuturist on your work or on any of your practices. But I did wonder if you could talk to us a little bit about how you see the that term and that kind of movement in some ways in relationship to your work, if you don't mind. No, Toma, do you mind going first since? No, not at all. Yeah. Um, I think my relationship to the term Afrofuturism is maybe I'll say an angsty one. Well, on one hand, because I deeply adore the work that it has gathered and been able to make visible, right? So like anyone you're naming under, under Afrofuturism, including the artists that are here, you know, like we've gathered under this term. And I, I think that there's very few other spaces that I see gathering creatives that are working as fluidly, as theoretically, as decolonially, as outside of the bounds of what we're what we've been taught. You know, like I, I really love what the term gathers, but at the same time, I also think that there wasn't a, like maybe in the past five years, um, there's become a laziness around the term too to just mean like any any work from Black people that is conceptually strong and out there is Afrofuturist, you know, and um, that push and pull, I feel like I struggle with, but I've, I've, you know, I ultimately do love the term because I think, especially when I look at artists that are younger than me who gather under this term, I think what, what the work that's coming out and the work that's, that's being consolidated and the power that's being consolidated is, is incredible. And so I ultimately do love the term. I just think that, you know, it's basis, it's not like, I'm, I'm so much more interested in the Afro, I think, than the futurism, you know? And I feel like um, the Afro is what bends the futurism to make it so interesting. And the Afro should be the sort of like centralized part of it. And um, the Afro is what connects us to like, to me, something that I've become more obsessed with is indigenous knowledge systems and trying to like translate that to something that feels relevant today. And I think the Afro aspect of Afrofuturism is where, where I kind of see the activity of the work, for example, presented here today and find it really fascinating. Um, but then it's, yeah, I'll, I'll stop there, but yeah, I would love to hear what others have to say. Either one of you want to jump in? Aaron, you got it. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I think I agree with Notama. Um, and I think I would key in uh, Nidio Korfo's uh, African Futurism as an idea to think about how um, the focus uh, through some of this work is shifting more towards the continent. I think for me, what has always been interesting is how thinking about the work happening um, say around artists from diaspora, from Africa, um, usually the center is in the West. And so asking how do we shift that center back to the continent? It's almost as though the work is almost always exported. You know, it's like positioning oneself to speak to that power. I think, uh, Notama, you said it beautifully when you were saying you're out looking for the money for the film, and then it's like, who are you speaking to? And then letting the work just organically happen. I think that's kind of those questions. How do we center back uh, the continent and the people on the continent, even from the diaspora, who are doing that sort of work. Um, and indigeneity, I think, is also very key for uh, some of the reconceptualizations around this, this term. Um, I think beyond just African futurism, it's like, are there other terms, other wordings that uh, don't exclude? Because I feel like uh, even thinking about how far back uh, Nkoloso termed, um, Afronaut, you know, it was before uh, Afrofuturism was 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 termed, and so thinking about what has been happening on the continent and this rich rich history uh, that goes beyond this sort of naming, you know, sometimes even the absence of a name is is powerful, but recognizing where the thing is coming from. I must feel like I don't need to say anything else. It's already been said. <laughs> um, <laughs> No, no, but honestly, like I, 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 I couldn't agree more. I mean, you know, you would have seen, of course, in in, in my presentation, the uh, the, the mention of uh, Sanko time, uh, a term that was coined during the process of of producing um, the, the the Relic Traveler series of films. I remember me and um, 
uh, Nefertiti, uh, my producer, would we would we would wax lyrical so much about kind of about creating names and words and drives on our own terms, you know. And again, it, it's with respect of what's come before us. So of course, um, on this side of the uh, the the planet, um, the importance of you know Black Audio Film Collective, uh, trying to come for a smoking dogs. Um, you know, uh, Sonia Boyce, Keith Piper, Eddie Chambers, you know, practitioners that, that, that were talking very much about the, 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 the future and, and, and the past already before, you know, Mark Berry came and, and, and coined the, uh, the, the term. And, you know, I think for me, if I'm honest, the thing that kind of bugged me was my work being framed within the, 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 the gaze of, of, of whiteness, you know, like it's just, it just doesn't write, you know, for me, I have, you know, I, I therefore, that, that, that the onus is on me therefore to create uh, that, 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 that language or that, that term by which you, you respond around, you know, what I do. Um, it's not so much in a way that it irritates me if, you know, someone kind of places my work, you know, with or within, you know, kind of, you know, Afrofuturism, again, I think with what's just been said, um, you know, there's for me, there's huge respect for for what's been been made, what's been created. But um, I think in in being able to unlearn what you know we've been kind of like in, you know drenched in in terms of um, you know Christian imperialism, it's important that we are able to find um, our own language, or if that means making a new language through thinking about the, the, the past and finding any which way in which to explore that. I don't think there's one complete, you know, linear way to do in that, hence Sanko time. I know too that you probably have questions for each other. So if you do just, you know, break in whenever you want, because I could keep asking questions forever. I mean, one of the things that I was just thinking when you said unlearning, because I was, I was like catching the strand of the, you know, fuck narrative, the kind of unlearning, unlearning the three act structure, the kind of unlearning, unbraiding that needs to be done here. And I was thinking, I still want to kind of circle back to that, like the figure of the astronaut and the idea of travel, space travel, time travel, all of these things as also a form of unlearning. And I'm always really interested. I mean, I loved your time is spent um, the, you know, the, the problem is, is we're seeing time within a capitalist production, right? And as we have to unlearn time as it's been presented, we have to unlearn space travel as it's been presented, right? Which was the, you know, the world power race to space crap that, um, the you know, in Zambia gets completely interrupted, right? So I wondered if you want to talk a little bit more about this kind of unlearning the within the kinds of forms that you're using, but I also think it's kind of a conceptual premise to what you're doing. I don't mind going first on that. Um, I, I didn't really kind of like talk about it in, in, in the presentation, but, you know, although, you know, I studied at art school, I had the opportunity, the, the privilege of studying at, at art school, um, even, even those approaches to, making film and, and utilizing sound which I, I don't get to talk much about but is very is is so important to the the experience of of of, of the film let alone the the growth of of the work um you know I, I didn't learn I didn't learn my process of making beats of of producing sounds at university art school I, I actually got to a point at the MA when, when I when, when I got into the MA where I you know I'd had enough already on my BA where um you know and again don't get me wrong I had some good some okay tutors some people who are really you know in, inspirational but essentially white people telling me that my experience was worth this and I needed to stop doing things about this or about identity I needed to move on with whatever and that was enough already for me as somebody who in, in growing up in the particular part of East London where you had sounds like garage, which were then morphing into uh, grime music, people who were creating incredible sounds using their bedroom studio. They talk about studio, you'd think it was an actual studio, but it was just someone's bedroom, you know? So that, 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 um, that type of practice 
married with the likes of my uncle who was DJing um, for, for parties, putting together uh, high life sounds with, with American hip hop and R&B. You know, my parents who would, would, would force us to go to, um, to church every Sunday. But, you know, again, even in retrospect, thinking about the, um, the, the, the community, the community that they that all of those people built within church. And when I'm saying church, I don't mean some building with all this stuff in it. I'm talking about some dingy community center that everybody's put money in from the multiple jobs that they've done to get together, you know, um, cause my dad didn't have time to learn and practice bass. He would play it with his, his brothers and his sisters. My mom would sing with her brothers and her sisters and so on. So, you know, that, that speaks volumes to me and it still does in terms of my approach to filmmaking. I don't, you know, um, it, it was so beautiful to hear um, your time. I talk about, um, th this way of filmmaking that is not reliant upon, you know, the, 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 the so-called big names and whatnot. And not to say that we're not deserving of that. And I'm looking forward to seeing, you know, this uh, feature length version of, of, of Afronauts. I'm a fan, but, you know, that there's so much more to it than simply just the budget. The, the, the story itself um, is also the story of, 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 of the creator. And, and, and that cannot be forced. You can't manipulate it. You can't, you know, kind of mass produce it. It has to be its own thing, which is why Afronauts is so impactful as it is, is which is why, you know, um, Aaron's work is as um, um, impactful as it is. Again, I, I, I can't go into your work, Aaron, because I think we'll be here forever and we'll, I'll waste time. But um, that, that aspect of resourcefulness, I think, is something that is, for us, inherently a, a very African thing. You know, that's what I've, I've grown up with and, and it's what I, I've, I've been hearing in these presentations. Um, thank you, Larry. I really connect to what you're saying. I, I think for me, the undoing just feels so integral to Black articulation, global Black articulation, just because of the material conditions, the power dynamics that we exist within. Um, I'm going to butcher that James Baldwin quote, but it's basically like to be a conscious Black person in America means you're in a constant state of rage. I think you just, if, if you are if you are talented, if you are strong, if you're trying to work from your power, you are having to punch up against and undo <laughs> the filter that you've been, been, been raised within and I think especially because when you are talented and you do get admitted into these like elite institutions strong institutions you're going maybe as talented as your peers but you're just immediately fighting that wall of misunderstanding so Larry when you're talking about your experience with your tutors I really connect to that and I think I had a moment I had long moments of rage because you know they're you know experiencing these things at the moment where I didn't know yet how to put two shots together. Like I'm here, I'm in film school, I'm learning how to just do this. So I can't even defend what I'm trying to express at the skill level that I need to be able to yet. And I'm already having to like, you know? So I think that, um, I think when it comes to like unbreeding three act structure and that sort of work and the necessity to do that, it is to say like, they got me at a time when I was so new in what I was doing that it just gets so braided on, so ingrained and it becomes so integral to the work to do it. But I also recently, because I'm at a place with my own skill and my mastery level, or whatever you would call it with what I do, where um, a sort of different question has become really interesting to me. And I think it came up for me actually when I was watching the trailer for Wayfinder, Larry, where, um, you know, this woman is negotiating this, this thing of like, you know, not, not feeling this like patriotism for, I'm gonna say, I'm assuming England or Britain the UK, um, but coming up against these negotiations of how to claim it. And I think sometimes, you know, that that is also kind of after the undoing, after the open scalp, after the freedom, what are we looking at and what are we standing with? Like, what are we really um, interrogating and, and experiencing and coming up against after that? It's like really, uh, has become like a really deep questioning point for me, especially because, you know, after years in Ghana, I still, I'm still based in Ghana, but I'm back in the US after, you know, and, you know, when I was in Ghana, I was just thinking, I'm never going back there. I'll never be there again. And, you know, it's like, what has brought me back? What am I trying to reclaim here in the US, you know, 
after that. So I think I just wanted to bring up that aspect of the undoing, the sort of after, <laughs> after undoing and, and how, you know, Larry, your, your trailer really brought, I really connected to that question. And I can't wait to see the film. I think something that stands out for me, uh, even listening to the both of you speak, is just how the personal stories uh, are really impactful, and how it's you know it's not something that is read in a book or imagined. It's kind of coming from the heart, coming from within, and I think that's where true and learning happens. You know, it's like it's going on inside of you, and you just have to let it out. And I think for me, one of the spaces was um, I remember a school trip that I took where. Uh, we were introduced to some of these museum objects and that's why I brought it up and in the, mu the the museum objects it was sort of framed as don't touch this this is this is evil this is something that you must be afraid of and so there was this barrier to a part of me that I felt I couldn't access you know culturally I felt uh, I couldn't engage with and um, I mean, reading things like Decolonize Your Mind by Ngugi Wationgo is something that opened up a space for me to, to think beyond this colonial setting. And so for me, some of that work is uh, speaking to these institutions of power, um, such as the museum, which holds a lot of history and, and has the power to frame narratives. And I think uh, trying to work with some of these objects to reframe the, the nomenclature or the way in which the perception is outside of those spaces has, uh, has been very important for me. And so I think that's still work I'm grappling with um, at the moment. I mean, that's really interesting because one of the things that I was thinking about was this tension between the unlearning and reclaiming. And I love that you say after the undoing and you have said after freedom, which I, like, what is it that, you know, needs to be gathered or what does that look like or, you know, all of that. So I was wondering if you all wanted to talk a little bit about this reclaiming and Aaron, maybe we could turn it back to you for a moment to talk a little bit. And I have to say our first question too was at, to asking everybody to elaborate on the idea of um, reclamation of materials and tools in art, but I would say the reclamation of stories too, right? Um, so, you know, and also the reclamation of spirituality because Aaron, you started us off at that point, right? This, the Christian imperialism, this, this, the, as this heavy hand on everything that you're insisting can be taken back and actually contains the power of flight, right? That there's something in spirituality that, right? Yeah, I think it's a sort of transcendent power. You know, it's like, how do you go beyond? I think for me, that's something similarly to you, Larry. I feel like when I was young, I went to church all the time, you know, and I still, I still go to church, but it's something that you did just as a family activity. It's like, hey, let's go to church on a Sunday. This is what we do as a family. And so um, I kind of had this idea that, oh, this is what uh, a spirituality looks like. And, you know, at the church we went to, uh, people were praying in tongues, rolling on the floor. And so it's like, ah, okay, what is this? Um, but then it's like, when you see it in another setting and you see uh, a sort of a local kind of presentation of that spirituality, it's like, no, that's bad. That's, that's not right, you know? And so I feel for me, reconciling those spaces and saying, one can't be put above the other has been very important because then it connects me back to the earth. It connects me back to the people, back to the ancestors, uh, you know, the people that went before and saying, you know, how do we, how do I demystify this? As well as looking at some of, um, yeah, material objects from, from, from spaces that are within uh, our cultural context. But I mean, I'll stop there so that I, I let, you know, conscious of the time, I'll let the both of you jump in. Okay, I'll go first. Um, <laughs> um, what does it look like? Uh, I guess my kids can probably tell you, and then maybe you know the 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 the, the kids after that. Um, I know for me as a practitioner, and it <laughs> probably sounds a bit kind of cheesy that you know, as the Spider Man comic goes, you know with great power comes responsibility but I, I really do believe as, as, as a practitioner you know we, we we have license to to dream to to talk to travel in ways that 
most people, if they did in those same spaces, they'd be ostracized or all kinds of things, you know, might happen. Um, that has led me on a, on a journey in which I've uh, considered and reconsidered um, uh, practices, again, joining with, with, with you, uh, Aaron, about, you know, being taken to church and so on. You know, my family, a lot of my family is, you know, still devout Christians. I don't say that I'm a Christian because I'm not. It's not, you know, but, you know, I'm not, I guess I'm not trying to fight them at the same time, you know, like, you know, I've shot films of my mum, for example, um, and I'm quite appreciative of the fact that there are, there are customs within my can heritage that still live within the Christianity that she speaks. So technically speak, it's not gone, but um, I feel like I have the task of, of, of unraveling part of that story. And I love the analogy that um, more time I used about Kente, you know, the, these kind of linked, you know, strands um we won't be able to achieve that entirely in our lifetime and that's okay anyway because the next lifetime is waiting to open up another part of that and and for me that's what's exciting you know that's what was exciting in the first place about you know um working on relic traveler it wasn't really about oh you know is that something that would be possible within uh one's lifetime no it is possible but really I'm interested in, oh, well, what happened kind of with the in-betweens and the build-up to that? Do you know what I mean? So it's no longer this thing about, oh, it's impossible. Or how could that happen on the African continent? Again, I've grown up with that. I've grown up with, you know, even like black kids telling me, oh, well, how the hell would that happen? No, well, it does, it can, and it will. It's happening, you know. Um, but that story, again, is waiting to be written. And and I see the way that we work is we, we're simply pieces of, of that larger, exciting story that unravels itself in time. No, Tom, I'm gonna let you talk, but I wanna bring in this question by Naomi that's also Brown has asked in the um, chat because they're asking about the links between culture and technology. Like, is culture a technology? And I thought that this, we really are almost out of time, but actually talking about that, because I think all of you are using culture as a technology, cultures, right, as technology. So do you mind taking that one on? Um, okay, yeah. Um, I did want to start maybe relatedly by saying that I too had the experience of being uh, like brought up in the church, <laughs> you know, and uh, having that move away from it and asking all these questions. So I think it's very interesting that, that it's so integral to a certain experience of our lives. Um, culture and technology. I. The way I would answer it is actually maybe connected to the question of like what happens after mm -hmm. after freedom because I was going to say that what ends up happening for me was an immense at first an immense opening in terms of like you know I was I was brought up in a way and this ties to the idea of culture versus civilization where it was sort of like you know for example with the example of writing we're going to write it within the tradition of Greek tragedy but it's an African story and so Africa like the African story gets like subsumed into a structure that is deemed um valuable or meaningful um and i think that when i when that break happened for me the opening is immense because all the things that we learn to see as culture become revealed to be immensely sort of like genius based <laughs> like the narrative structures are genius these things are technologies they enable us to see things and do things in new ways they're not just stories within a, a framework that is decided elsewhere um, everything that we're looking at and we're and that's why I was pointing to Kente too like these things that we're looking at and saying oh they're decorative or we put African art on a wall these things get revealed to be things that were tools towards something else as in or, or technologies and so that's how I would maybe situate that um, but I also did want to mention that after the opening after the freedom and also just like in terms of like everything that felt explosive I wanted to maybe also connect back to what Aaron was saying about trying to find information about this uh, spiritual object and not being able to find that information and people are scared to speak. And also I feel like what has happened in the post and has to do with culture is I'm also learning that sometimes actually you don't have to speak. Cause I think coming from a more like Americanized space representation was such a huge part of the ask wanting to be represented 
here, Oscar, so white, wanting to be represented. And I think what has completely shifted for me now is like, it's the blind spot of the mainstream that they can't see what is already so amazing, fluid and generative and huge, you know? And I, I just think that sometimes silent and, and, and taking the freedom of being to the side <laughs> feels more interesting to me to be in a real space that is generative and awesome and rather than like fighting to be seen in um, a sort of grander space. Does that make sense? And so that, I, I just feel like it came up for me also by trying to do oral, trying to gather oral histories and coming up against this thing of people not wanting to speak and also seeing the power in that and the way things have been preserved, certain things are preserved because they haven't been shared freely. And also then thinking about my place within that, you know, like what am I willing to share in what spaces and to whom and with whom that that has become a huge like Larry was saying the responsibility <laughs> of it has become really huge to me and how what I'm able to share and where and why so this was just fantastic I think we could probably talk for another hour but we have to <laughs> we have to stop because we're trying to be mindful of time but thank you so much and I do think and I want to thank you for sharing in your generosity all of you because I think that you've given us like these little openings that we could just fall through it is really just a rich and wonderful conversation that I'll be thinking about for a long time so thank you so much I'll see all of you in the other zoom so we can say thank you more privately and have look and uh, have another moment but thanks so much thank you everybody for joining us today thanks very much Bye.